Okay, so it's my pleasure to introduce Don Sage's uh, third lecture of the series. And he will speak today on quasi-modular forms and counting problems in topology and group theory. So, thank you. So, today will be a somewhat different subject from the first two. Well, in fact, every day is a somewhat different subject from every other day. The common theme, of course, being that modular forms are always very much present. Uh, I wanted, before I start for today, to make a small correction uh, to something I said on the first day. It wasn't wrong, but it was maybe confusing. And anyway, it will be a nice, you can relax, because you've seen this. But on the first day, I talked about applications of modular forms in classical number theory, like Diophantine equations or other fields. And among the many, many problems that I mentioned, there must have been, uh, I think, 10 applications. One was the very classical problem. Given the number n, is it a sum of two squares? And I gave a complete uh, answer and even a formula for the number of pairs, a and b, such that a squared plus b squared equals a given number n. And that formula, I can even remind you of the formula, the number of solutions, so this is the number of pairs, a, b in z times z, such that the equation is true. This was given by an explicit and very simple formula. You sum over all divisors of d, uh, such that d is odd, minus 1 to the d minus 1 over 2. And then I had a similar formula, which I won't write up again, for a sum of four squares. But then I talked later about Sylvester's problem, which is to decide whether a given number is a sum of two cubes. And I gave answers in two special cases. One was twice a prime, that's a theorem of Sachet. One was a single prime, that's a theorem of Fernando and myself uh, by quite a few years ago. Uh, but then it struck me afterwards that I left out one important thing. Here, implicitly, when I write this, I mean that a and b are integers, as I wrote here. And here they're integers. If you ask simply, is n a sum of two squares, then it's not quite obvious, but true, that if you have some n, which can be rented, represented as a sum of two squares, even using rational numbers, then you can also find a solution using integers. So if you just want to know, is there any representation, it doesn't matter here whether you say it over q or over z. And here it also doesn't matter because the answer is always yes in both cases. But if you ask for the number of representations, of course, here, it's the number of integral representations. So I implicitly meant integral. But here I forgot to say it. Here it's absolutely important that you have to take a and b. You have to allow rational numbers. So if you only take integers, it's kind of a bit random. There are only a handful for given n, a handful of possibilities. Well, if n isn't too big, and it seems to have no special structure. There seems to be no good interest. So when I gave theorems that said that certain numbers, like, for instance, every prime of the form 4 modulo 9, so every prime, it's so a 4k plus 9, so every prime which is congruent to 4 modulo 9 implies this is, I think this is now actually known due to a theorem of Elkis that he did or did not ever finally publish, then it's true that this is always true, but only if you allow rational squares. So if I take an example, if I take 13, which is 9 plus 4, then according to this theorem, it should be a sum of cubes. But if you think of the cubes, they're 1, 8, 27. And even if you allow negative cubes, which you should, uh, then you, you see that you, there's no way to get 13, because 27 is too big, and 1 and 8 don't add up right. So it certainly doesn't work with integer cubes. And in this case, you have instead 7 thirds cubed plus 2 thirds cubed. So in other words, 343 divided by 27 plus 8 divided by 27 is 351 over 27, which is indeed 13. But I just wanted to correct in case I gave a wrong impression. And while I'm on the subject, I should say that this equation, and I mentioned it the other time, and that's why modular forms can be used, if you fix p like 13, and think of this as an equation in two unknowns. Let's call them x and y. x cubed plus y cubed equals p. You could draw a graph. That will be an elliptic curve. And an elliptic curve is a group. 
And so if you have one solution, you have twice it and three times, so you get infinitely many for free. This was noticed already by Diophantus in the third century in some very special case. Of course, he didn't know the, the theory, and Fermat in other special cases. So in this case, for instance, as well as this, you could also take 2,513 over 1,005 cubed and minus 1,388 over 1,005 cubed. And I'm sure that all of you can immediately see that that thing is again 13. So I just wanted to mention that, first of all, it's very beautiful that if you have a solution, you have infinitely many, but in a rather tricky way and quite big. And secondly, I wanted not to pre uh, give the impression of having said something that isn't true, that we know when a prime or any number is a sum of integral cubes. So that's not part of today's lecture. That's part of the first lecture that I didn't say. So today, the main hero of today's lecture, well, apart from multiple forms, of course, will be partitions of numbers. And so actually, pretty much everything I say will be connected with partitions. That's on the number theory side or the combinatorial side. Then on the multiple forms side, it's a particular function called eight of tau that I think I did not introduce the first day. I'm beginning to forget what I've said and what I haven't because after the lecture, there's a question, uh, a question and answer session with the students, very lively at least so far. I hope it continues. And there, there were many questions and I told, but I, I told a little about partitions then, but I'll have to repeat that. And I think I'd, I know I introduced eight of tau there, but I think only there. And then there will also be a topological side. So the part of the story will have to do with topology. And this will have to do with coverings of surfaces. But that part will be relatively brief. So I want to start with partitions, because it's something completely elementary. This is not even number theory, although partitions have very interesting number theoretical properties. It's pure combinatorics. And so if I have a number n, say a positive integer, then you speak of a partition of n. Well, there are many, many ways to write it. But let me first say in words what it is. Let's say n is 5. And the idea is you have five objects, and you divide them up into groups. So for instance, you might, it might be five students in a class, and you send three of them into one room to work on a problem, and one into another room and one into a third room to work on different problems. But we don't number the students, we don't identify, they don't have names. So of typical partitions, I divide up five into a group of three, a group of one, and a group of one. So if you think of how many ways there are to do that, well, you could either not divide the students at all, or you could divide them into two groups, in which case the groups would be of four and one, or three and two. Or there could be three groups, in which case it would have to be 3 plus 1 plus 1, or 2 plus 2 plus 1. Or it could be four groups, then it has to be 2 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1. Or it could be five groups, in which case you would have this. And so if you count 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, you see that there are uh, seven partitions. So each of these, so this is a partition of five. But as I said, the order doesn't matter. I don't number anything. I could also put 1 plus 3 plus 1. It's considered the same partition. So if you want, if you want a formal definition, you could always, as I did here, put them in decreasing order. So lambda is in the set of partitions of n, or some people write lambda and then this symbol, uh, uh, lambda partitions n, uh, means that lambda is a decreasing sequence like here, it would be 3, 1, 1. So the sum of all the lambdas is equal to n, and they're all bigger than or equal to 0. And you can either stop with the finite number, or if it makes you happy, and it will make me happy a little later, you can also add zeros to infinity. It still adds up to 5. So that's a formal definition. But this is the sort of uh, really what it is. It's just a way of dividing up n into positive pieces where the ordering doesn't count. And then you have P of n, which is the number of partitions.
So in particular, P of 5, I just did that example. I, I wrote them all out, and there were seven of them. So P of 5 is 7. So if you make a table, oh, well, I now realize that I should have copied out a nice table somewhere, but I didn't. If you make a table, then 1 has only one partition, namely 1. 2 is two partitions, 1 plus 1 or 2. 3 has three partitions, 1 plus 1 plus 1, or 1 plus 2, or 2 plus 1 if you prefer decreasing, or 3. 4 has five partitions, you can find them easily. 5 I just did has 7. 6 has, uh, if I remember correctly, it continues 11, 15, and 22, I think are the next few. I didn't specially prepare, and there are various reasons that it's intelligent to say that 0 has one partition, namely the empty set is the only way you can do it, but there is one way, namely the empty set. Uh, okay, you might argue about that, but for the formulas, it's better to set p of 0 equal to 1. Okay, so this problem goes back to Euler, who anyway is my uh, big hero, who invented sort of everything in modern mathematics in the, in the first form. You can see in Euler practically everything. And uh, so in particular, he, he invented partitions. And he also invented a wonderful thing called generating functions, which absolutely everybody, certainly every mathematics student, I think also everybody doing uh, physics or anything that uses mathematics should be aware. Many, many are. It's very well known. But surprisingly, many people don't think of generating functions, or they're also called generating series, as a key tool in their arsenal. And it should be one of the best tools that anybody who uses mathematics has. It's a very, very simple and very powerful idea. And the idea, which also goes back to Euler, in fact, in exactly this context, is this. If you have a sequence of numbers and you want to understand their property, so these have many, many properties. I'll give you an example at random. Uh, if you could ask the asymptotic properties, which in this case is known, these things grow less than exponentially, but more than a polynomial. They grow like this e to the square root of n times a constant, but it's a strange constant, pi times the square root of 2 thirds divided by 4 times n times, it's by memory. I'll write 3, but it could be 2. I simply forgot to look it up. It's one or the other. If you take on your computer n equals 100, you can find out immediately which, they're very different, except you won't know what p of n is. But I'll tell you in a minute how to find it. So that would be a typical property. So I'm just saying properties. So it might be an asymptotic property, or it might be a congruence property, like the one that, uh, Uh, Ramanujan found, you see that p of 4 is 5, p of 9 is 30, and they're both divisible by 4, and what he found is that whenever n is of the form 5j plus 4, then p of this is divisible by 5. So you might want some property, like a congruence, an asymptotic property, many, many others that I could think of. And what Euler found, and that what we know today, is that a very, very good way to understand the properties of any sequence of numbers is to make the generating function. Actually, I used it yesterday very strongly because at the upper e numbers, a0 is 1, a1 is 5, a2 is 73. But then I immediately turned them into a power series. Some a and t to the n is 1 plus 5t plus 73t squared. And that didn't seem to help much except that the recursion became a differential equation. But then suddenly, this thing had the wonderful property that if t was a special modular function, that this sum became a modular form. So I just wanted to emphasize, I should have said it already yesterday, that it's very natural if you have a sequence to look at the corresponding generating function. You usually use x. Sometimes you might want a generating function with x to the n over n factorial. There are many such cases, but here we don't. So it's p of n over x to the n. And then Euler found, and this maybe I'll explain because you can almost do it in your head. He found that this factors as an infinite product. OK? So it is this infinite product, or in a math more modern mathematical notation, it's the product m from 1 to infinity of uh, 1 over 1 minus x to the m. So this is very easy. He did not spend years proving this. Uh, namely, the reason is this is pure thought. If you multiply this out, then the first term, the right-hand side, 
1 over 1 minus x is a geometric series, and if x is small, and in a power series you always think of the variable as being small, even in some sense infinitesimally small, then 1 over 1 minus x is just the sum of 1 plus x to the i for all i. So here we have the sum x to the a. But then for the same reason, 1 over 1 minus x squared is 1 plus x squared plus x to the fourth and so on. So it's the sum x to the 2b. And then similarly, 1 plus x cubed plus x to the sixth would be the 1 over 1 minus x cubed. So this would be the sum x to the 2c. And now the beauty of generating functions is that when you just multiply this out, even if there are infinitely many factors, it doesn't matter. Well, this is the sum over all possibilities a and b and c and so on, all at least zero. And the exponent will now be a plus 2b plus 3c and so on. So if I multiply out the right-hand side and ask for the coefficient of x to the n, I'm asking in how many ways can I write n as a sum of so many ones, a ones, so many twos, b twos, so many threes, c threes, and so on. But then it's clear that that's simply the way of writing n as a sum of positive integers where you've put them in some order. And so it is the partitions of n, and so I've just proved uh, this identity of Euler, which he proved exactly the same way. Okay, so he studied that. He had this wonderful idea of, of using generating functions. He found this factorization uh, a little simpler, but, but much simpler than, well, that's also very simple. His famous Euler product for the so-called Riemann zeta function. But then he wanted to compute these numbers, and he computed quite a few. But very, very quickly, the way that I did it here, just in my head or with you, I said, OK, if you divide 5 into 3 pieces, it's 3, 1, 1, or 2, 2, 1. But try dividing 100 into 57 pieces, and you'll find you can't do it in your head or even on paper, because there are trillions and trillions of solutions. These numbers grow very quickly, as I told you, less than exponentially. But still, if let's say n is 100, 200 over 3 is 67, squared of 67 is 8 and a bit, times 3 and a bit, so this is about 8 e to the 30, so about 10 to the 10. You're talking about a 10-digit number. So you can't just list the partitions. And he wanted to actually compute them, and he wrote down a formula that later, the famous combinatorialist Major McMahon actually used to compute by hand, of course, uh, up to 300, and he got them all right. So, and there are 200, I think, but they're absolutely gigantic numbers. So what Euler did is he said, this was a very natural question to ask in combinatorics. This was the answer. But if you just look at this function directly without knowing where it came from, you would say, what a funny thing to look at. Why are you taking the reciprocal of everything? Why not look at the actual product, 1 minus x to the n, which is 1 minus x times 1 minus x squared. So he said that would be a much more natural thing to look at. And then if you know the coefficients of this power series, well, this power series multiplied by that power series gives 1, because that's the reciprocal. And so if you have some answer for this, let's call them q of n, although it's a very poor name, then you'll have here q of, let's call it something else, q of l, x to the l, and that's 1. Well, that means the first coefficient, p of 0 times q of 0, will be 1. So this is 1, and that's also 1. That's not very interesting. But all the higher coefficients are 0. So you'll get p of n plus p of n minus 1 times q of 1 up to dot, 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 up to q of n, and this will add up to 0. So if you know the q's, you get a recursion for the p's. And if, you f if you're making a table, well, then you can very, very quickly get p of n if you know its predecessors. So he said, if we're lucky and we can figure out a closed formula for these coefficients, then we can find the partitions inductively. So he did this, and of course, there were no computers, so he multiplied it out. And I want to emphasize this, 50 terms. I mean, now I can do 5,000 in, in one second in Paris on a computer, but Euler, obviously by hand in the 18th century, did this to 50 terms by hand. He did not consider it was beneath his dignity to do a big calculation if he was trying to understand how something worked. And what he found was very, very surprising and very beautiful. He found that if you do this, he went all the way to 50, I've just gone up to 22, uh, that all of the coefficients are 0, 1, or minus 1. So it starts 1, minus 1, minus 1, but the next two coefficients are 0. It's 0 times x cubed, 0 times x to the fourth, then there's a 1, 0, 1. And the pattern was also, there's a 1, then 1 minus 1, then two zeros, then one, 
oh, sorry, two minus ones, minus one, minus one, with no space, then one, zero, one, with one, zero between them, then eight, nine, 10, 11, four zeros, and then minus one, zero, zero, minus one. So the pattern was very easy to see, uh, namely the, the gaps between them were two zeros, four zeros, six zeros, and the numbers were two ones with no, nothing between, two ones with zero between, two ones with two zeros between, and so on, and then alternating sign. So if you work out what that says, then you find that his, what he discovered experimentally can be written as the sum k from minus infinity to infinity, minus one to the k, times q to the three k squared plus k over two. And these are the so-called pentagonal numbers, so he called that the These numbers have nothing to do with those numbers, so they're both correct. These numbers are the exponents of this series, and these numbers are the coefficients of this series. So that's, I'm glad for the question, because it, 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 in fact, that's why I was not sure of my memory, because I remembered 11, 15, and 22. It's a little confusing that there's an, a, a 15 and a 22 in both, and a 7, and a five, in fact, I have no idea if there's any reason for that. I think not, but I've noticed it before. So just to say it again, let me call this Euler series capital P of X. And let me call this one Q of X. But of course, Q of X, because of Euler's identity, is one over P of X. So the product, P of X times Q of X, is simply one. And so to write it out in all its glory, I should have done that, P of X has these numbers as its coefficients. So every exponent occurs, Not, there are no gaps, there are no zeros, but the coefficients are the numbers that you saw here. Uh, 11, x to the sixth, and so on. Whereas q of x, which is one over p of x, uh, starts completely differently, one minus x minus x squared plus zero x cubed plus zero x to the fourth plus one x to the fifth plus zero x to the sixth, minor, uh, plus one times x to the seventh, and so on. So those numbers are the exponents, and the other co the coefficients are always one, and the other coefficients are simply zero. Whereas these numbers with the coefficients are the exponents took on every value. And now indeed, you see if I multiply, the coefficient of x is one minus one is zero. The coefficient of x squared two minus one minus one is zero. Three minus two minus one plus zero is zero. Five minus three minus two plus zero plus zero is zero. And so on, the product of them is one. So this is what Euler found. Now, if Euler had been a genius, but of course Euler was a genius, then he would have now at this point said, aha, I should do two things. Sorry? Oh, sorry, I'm going ahead. I'm a genius and Euler wasn't, that's the problem. You'll see in a moment why I called it Q. Sorry, thank you, that's an X. So, had Euler been a genius, which of course, as I say, Euler certainly was, then he would have said what Euler should have thought. He should have thought two things, and he missed them both. It was really very shameful. One, I need an X to the 124th. Now, why is that? Well, that's very simple. Because when you, when you go to school, and you know, Euler had gone to school, of course, quite a while ago, then you learn about completing the square. If you have to solve a quadratic equation, ax squared plus bx plus c equals zero, then what you do is you say, well, it starts, uh, let's pretend it's a square. So then the thing I'm squaring would have to have a b over 2a. And then, unfortunately, it's not quite right, so then I have to subtract b minus b squared over 4a. But you write it first by completing the square. So we all learned that in school to solve quadratic equations. If you see a quadratic expression, which is a linear term, you shift the variable a little bit to kill it. So here, if I shift k by a sixth to the left, k minus a sixth, then k squared will start, will be replaced by k squared, well, if I, in the positive direction, k squared plus k over three. So this becomes that. So if I rewrite six k plus one as, for instance, m, then you see that m squared is 36k squared plus, 36, uh, plus 12k plus 1. And so therefore, m squared minus 1 divided by 24, as it happens, is 3k squared plus k over 2. And so what Euler should have done is looked at that and said, aha, 3k squared plus k over 2 
is dying for an x to the 124th. So my power series q of x shouldn't have been q of x at all. It should have been x to the 124th. And then my formula would be the sum over all m of the form 6k plus 1. So m is now, uh, I can write in 6z plus 1. It's 6 times an integer plus 1, or I could put m congruent to 1 multiplied by 6, if you like that. And then I would have minus 1 to the k, which is now minus 1 to the m minus 1 over 6, times x to the m squared over 24. That's what Euler should have done. And then secondly, he should have said, but this you really couldn't expect him to, and I jumped the gun slightly, of course x shouldn't be called x, it should be called q. Because of course this is a multitor variable, it's the e to the 2 pi i tau of multitor forms. But that was only to come uh, you know, 150 years later, so that when he couldn't really have known that x should be called q. But he could have seen the x to the 124th, and I'm showing you that it comes in a natural way. And if you remember in the first and the second lecture, I think, I had some theta series like the sum q to the n squared, and various others, I had a theta 2 and a theta 3, where you shifted n by bit, but every theta series has the form q to the length squared of a vector. So it's never shifted by anything, but there may be congruence conditions, so you may shift the vector, but the exponent should always be a perfect square. I mean, it's the square of the length. So here, this is very natural. And so if we do what he should have done, namely called it q, but he couldn't know that, and if we also know, as we now know we should do, we should think of this as a function of uh, q of, of tau, where q is as always e to the 2 pi at tau. Then if I take this inverse power series that I've been talking about, and then it should have a name and it shouldn't be capital Q anymore. In fact, it should be eta. This is the famous dedicant eta function, which was not quite invented by eta, sort of uh, by dedicant, <laughs> certainly not by eta. Uh, it was named by him and he found its main properties, but it was based he wrote this, uh, the paper in, I think, around 1867. Uh, Riemann uh, lived from 1826 till he was 40, 1866. And when he died, uh, Dedekind was given the job of editing his unedited papers that he'd left with, you know, half-finished papers and notes and so on. So various fragments, and in, he wrote one paper on a fragment of Riemann where he found essentially this function and worked out many things that Riemann hadn't completely worked out. Of course, Dedekind was himself an extremely high-level mathematician, but not quite of the level of genius of Riemann. And he proved what, in a modern point of view, is that it's a modular form. Because let's look at this function. What Dedekind proved is that if you invert this tau, and here it's important to have the tau and not the q. If you invert tau, then the function only changes by a very simple function factor, which is the square root of tau over i. And since it's also clear that if you replace tau by tau plus 1, then you get just zeta 24 times eta of tau, where I use this kind of standard notation, zeta n is the standard nth root of unity. So if you draw the circle, you take an angle 2 pi over n. That's 1, and that's zeta n. So th this is obvious from the function equation, because if you change tau by 1, you don't change q. But you have a different 24th root e to the 2 pi i times tau has changed by factor e to the 2 pi i over 24, which is this eta. So these two things tell you it's a modular form of way to half, because here it's tau to the half, except that it's a little strange, and I actually never defined what multiple forms of way to half are. But in particular, if I now define delta to be eta to the 24, that's the one that I did show you. And that was the reason that we needed that funny 24th, but it's exactly to get rid of this zeta 24. Now you simply have delta of tau plus 1 is equal to delta of tau, and delta of minus 1 over tau, if you take the 24th power, you get simply tau to the 12th. And so this exactly tells you, as I told you on the first day, that this is a modular form of weight 12. So that's the dedicant eta function, and the connection now is that the reciprocal of the dedicant eta function is uh, the generating function of partitions. And you also see that Euler was lucky because he wanted this recursion. And as I wrote out the recursion, I think I raced it. <coughs> it's here, but I raced most of it. You had many terms uh, that 0 is equal to p of n plus p of n minus 1 times q of 
n, which is here minus. But now we're very lucky because not only we have a closed formula for q, but it's incredibly simple. Every q is either 1 or minus 1 or 0, and most of them are 0. So actually the recursion takes on the very simple form, if I put p of n on the left, that p of n is the sum of the two predecessors. That's why it starts out like the Fibonacci numbers, because each Fibonacci number is the sum of its two predecessors. But then you know, this next, that would be these two. And then this one kicks in, so now it's minus p of n minus 5, minus p of n minus 7, plus p of n minus 12, etc. So therefore, uh, you know, you get, uh, that's very, very quick. If n is 100, there are only approximately the square root of 100, so about 10 terms on the right, and the coefficients are plus or minus 1, so it's extremely easy, and as I said, it was done by hand up to 200 by General McMahon with no mistakes. Yes, please. Well, I'm telling what Euler did, and the connection with modular forms. I'm not saying there aren't other ways, but I'm trying to tell the connection to modular forms. Yeah. You're absolutely right, yes. You're absolutely right, there is another way. But, uh, yeah, but it's much harder to add up 10,000 numbers with a positive sign than 100 numbers with plus or minus. Because you put the positive at the left and the negative on the right, it's all positive signs and you do one subtraction, it's not a big deal. You're completely right, so let me translate the comment, also you didn't have a microphone, for the others. Here, when I went through the ones for five, I sort of mentally grouped them into dividing five up into one pieces, two pieces, three pieces, four pieces, or five pieces. So if you make pj of n, the number of ways to do it, there's an easy recursion, and indeed, Fernando will tell you that, uh, you know, recently I had to program p of n, not just the number, but also the list of partitions. That's, if you want the complete list, that's much faster. Uh, in fact, it, 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 this doesn't work, but this is much faster. But anyway, I'm trying to tell the connection with modular forms, and that isn't one. So it is no, I'm not saying there are no other ways to study partitions. There are many books about partitions, and of course, there's much to be said. I don't know what you mean. Both formulas are true. It's, neither formula is obvious. They both have to be proved. And when you prove them, then, of course, they agree. I, I don't understand the question. Is it obvious? It's, it's not obvious that you get the same number, but both theor theorems are true. So there are many, many recursions for any given set of numbers. Or there, potentially, there's no reason that the a number is a number. The formula for the number is not unique. You can write the, the number according to many, many formulas. So I'm just describing the one that that is relevant for my story. I should go faster because I'm not going to, I mean, not faster speaking, but faster mathematically, because I'm not getting anywhere. So let me say a little bit more about this function. Uh, it's, it's a wonderful function. I mean, yesterday, when I talked about the lambda function, I gave you two identities, but now I don't have them written down. But one of them, you might even remember, because it's a little surprising. We had this theta series, which is the sum q to the n squared that I used the first day for talking about sums of two and four squares. And then, very remarkably, this thing also has a product expansion, uh, which is as follows. It's eight of two tau to the fifth divided by eight of tau squared times eight of four tau squared. So, uh, so in other words, this is the product over all m from one to infinity of one minus q to the two m to the fifth divided by 1 minus q to the m squared times 1 minus q to the 4m squared. OK, so that's not obvious. It follows from an identity of, of Jacobi. So all of these are very classical things. And so one can ask the question, and I asked that many years ago, if I have some product of eta's, some product a of d tau to some exponent, let's say, you know, nu, nu of d or n of d, uh, of course, there should only be finitely many d's. So here I'll put d goes to infinity, but I could also put you know, d goes up to some, some finite value. It's a finite product, but the exponents can be positive or negative. Like here we have a 5, we have minus 2's. But sometimes this is holomorphic. In other words, it looks like I've divided by something, but actually the quotient is this, and it's a perfectly good holomorphic multiple forms. There are more form. There are no poles. So you can ask a question, when is this holomorphic. So I made a conjecture, actually I made two conjectures, 
and I'll write down the, the statement just for fun as a theorem. So both theorems were proved, uh, this is many years ago, 15 years ago, by a student of mine, Mersmann, in an extremely complicated way. It's the harder theorem, it's like a 60-page double induction. It's never been published except in his thesis because it was just too complicated. And then a much more recent student who's sitting in the audience, Shomo Bhattacharya, who's right there, uh, in his thesis, uh, he did other things, but in particular he found a much uh, nicer, it's based in some sense, some of, many of the ideas came from Meersman, but there are many new ones, it's much simpler. Anyway, but I mean, if I'm really rigorous, I should say just this, because he proved the theorem. And the theorem is, if the weight is a half, then there's a finite list. And I'd conjectured that on the basis of computer experiments. I found exactly 14, and just for fun, let me write them down, because it's not that long, but I'll use an abbreviated notation where I'll just put the powers of you know, the, the multiple and the exponent. So I would write this as just 2 to the 5th, 1 to the 5th, 4 to the 5th, so I don't have to write all of that. Then the, there's only one that involves 1. There's, there are 2 that involve 1 and 2. That's 1 squared over 2. That means a to tau squared over a to 2 tau and 2 squared over 1. There are 3 that involve 4, up, up to 4, divisors of 4. of which the third is the one that we just saw. So the, the fourth is this two to the, sorry, if, it would be if I wrote it correctly, two to the fifth over one squared, four squared. Then there are four that involve the device of six, one squared, six over two times three, two squared, three over one times six, two, three squared over one times six, and one, six squared over two times three. There's some logic in them, as you can probably even see. And then there are four more that involve devices of 12. There's no particular point to writing them down if you're taking notes, uh, but they're, of course, in the one, two, three. Uh, 12 to the fifth. And the theorem that Meresman proved is that if you have weight a half, which simply means that, this, that there are, there's one more eight upstairs than downstairs, so five is one more than two plus two, because the weight of each eight is a half, then this is the complete list up to a stupid rescaling. Of course, I could replace tau by 6 tau. And then there's a second theorem that I won't write down. If the weight is 1 or 3 halves or any fixed half integer, then it's also a finite list if you only look at the irreducible ones in some sense. I don't want to write it down carefully. And that's the main theorem, the hard one, that uh, also Bhattacharya found a much simpler proof of. So this is very pretty. And in this connection, I should briefly mention a wonderful theorem uh, of Saren Stark, so it's, I don't know, 25 or 30 years ago by now, and the theorem is that all multiple forms of weight a half, which I haven't defined rigorously, but I've given you various examples, they're always theta series. So we just saw that for, from the eta function. The eta function is this, and then it's written as a sum, q to a square, well, square over 24, so it is a theta series, and the Saren Stark theorem is that they always are. So as an example, if I take this one, let's just take this one, so if I write this one out, in case you've forgotten the notation, it means 8 of tau, 8 of 4 tau, 8 of, is it 6 tau to the fifth, over 8 of 2, 3, and 6, I think, squared. So this is quite a complicated expression, but it has weight. 1 plus 1 plus 5 is 7, minus 2 plus 2 plus 2 is 6, so it is... There's one eta function net, which is weight a half. So by the Sarah Stork theorem, this has to be a sum. And actually, it's given by exactly the same uh, formula as the one of uh, Euler. Namely, n is congruent to 1 multiplied 6. And you've q to the m squared over 24. And the only thing that changes is for Euler, this was m minus 1 over 2. And now it's m squared minus 1 over 16. So just as an example of the power of the theory, such an identity is quite amazing. But not only you can prove it with modular forms, but you can predict it. You know a priori that this thing has to have such an identity. Well, I'm not even close to my actual subject of this lecture, but I wanted to take a certain amount of time. And in fact, I want to still stay far from the subject of my lecture and give one more example, because it's the famous rogers ramanujan identities, which many, many people consider the most 
beautiful formulas in all the mathematics. And if you just want a beautiful looking formula, it's not one you can show to your friends if they're not mathematicians. It's you know, much more complicated looking than e to the 2 pi i equals 1, but it's, it's a much, much more interesting formula. Actually, there are three formulas. One is a pair. So I'll write the pair first. These are the so-called Rogers. They were actually were discovered by Rogers, and then about 12 years later, I think, by, independently by Ramanujan with a different proof. And then he learned about Rogers, and they met, and they wrote a third paper with a third proof, a joint paper. So the Rogers Ramanujan dentists, there are two of them. And I, they would have used x, but I'll use q right away. You take in the numerator q to the n squared and the denominator 1 minus q up to 1 minus q to the n. OK? Let me just call this so I have a name for it, g of q. I won't need it till in a few minutes. So if I write this out, it's 1 plus q over 1 minus q plus q to the fourth over 1 minus q to the q times 1 minus q squared, and so on. So of course, you can expand each of these as a geometric series. So this one starts 1 plus q plus q squared plus q q plus q to the fourth, and so on to infinity. But then I get another q to the fourth. And so you can compute as many terms as you want, and they grow very rapidly, more or less like the partitions, also e to the square root of n times a constant. And then there's a pair. And the other one is exactly the same in all respects. I write the same thing. But you change the exponent from n squared to n squared plus n. So that's now 1 plus q squared over 1 minus q plus q to the sixth over 1 minus q times 1 minus q squared, and so on. So that's equal to 1 plus q squared plus q cubed plus q to the fourth, and so on. And now the identity, this is just you know, computing the first few terms. The wonderful identity, maybe I'll write it in a different color to make it stand out more. The identity is that this thing, well, any power series that starts with 1, you can write as a product 1 minus q to some power, and then 1 minus q squared to some other power. You can always expand a power series starting with 1 as a product 1 minus q to the n to some power. That's something you can see easily just by induction. At each stage, you've adjusted the first n exponents to match the first n coefficient, and then the next one, you, there's a unique way to make it fit. So when you do this, you find something very remarkable. It starts 1 minus q. The next term is 1 minus q to the fourth, then 1 minus q to the sixth, 1 minus q to the ninth, and so on. You never get anything in the numerator, and you never get any power of 1 minus q to the i different from the first or the 0. So every power is 0 or minus 1. And the powers you get, these numbers, you quickly see 1 and 4, then 6 and 9 is 5 plus 1 and 4. These are simply the numbers which are congruent to either 1 or 4 modulo 5. So this is considered by many people, certainly also by me, very surprising and very beautiful. Because even though it's, you would say, why look at this? There's a reason. And I should mention that these two functions and the whole story I'm about to tell is, is used, for instance, in rational conformal field theory for in conformal field theory for the rational conformal field theory with central charge 22 over 5. I mean, this comes up in many places, actually, in mathematics and physics. But even without motivation, what's surprising is that here you write something very uniform. There's no 5 inside, and suddenly there's a 5. And similarly, the other one, h, if you do it, it's 1 over, and now what you get is the other ones, not the multiples of 5, but the other non-multiples, so 2, 3, uh, 7, 8, and so on. In other words, you get the product n is congruent to 2 or 3 mod 5 of the same thing. So you notice each of these is just like Euler's formula for the partitions. But it's only this. So this actually means that if you expand this out, these coefficients, like these two, is the number, these coefficients are the number of partitions of n into parts which are quadratic residues of 5 and quadratic non-residues of 5, if you want the uh, sort of number theorist's way of saying it. And then there's a final formula, which is, that's really the most beautiful of all. If you divide one of these by the other, so I assume most of you have seen the Legendre symbol, but here I can just say it. The Legendre symbol n over 5 is plus 1 if n is congruent to 1 or 4 modulo 5. It's minus 1 if n is congruent to 2 or 3 modulo 5. And it's 0 if n is congruent to 0 modulo 5. In other words, divisible by 5. So that's the famous Legendre symbol in this case. So by what I've already written, h over q, by what I've already written is the product over all numbers 
of 1 minus q to the n to the Legendre symbol. And now, you, don't, you can't deduce directly from that, but from the proof of these, you find the rolls ramanujan continued fraction, which is really a thing of beauty. Because again, there are the fives on the left, but there are no fives on the right. And you get something, is it plus or minus, now forgotten. Uh, it should be plus, of course. You get it. I won't explain what continued fractions are if you've never seen them. But even if you've never seen them, if you expand just what I wrote, q to the cubed over 1, add 1, q squared over that, add 1, q over that, add 1, and take the reciprocal, little, agree with this to four terms, and that's what I, or even more, I think, and that's what I mean in general. So there's abs absolutely a wonderful continued fraction, and this is the formula that many people say would be their, their, their candidate for the single most astounding formula that you can just write down with no explanation if you know the Legendre symbol in all of mathematics. Okay, that's not my topic for today actually at all, except that since my topic of the whole course is modular forms, I should say, and that's absolutely crucial, that of course these things are modular forms, but as usual, just as Euler, you know, you, shouldn't, you should use tau rather than q, and also there's a power missing, and it turns out to be here the minus 1 60th power, and here the 11 60th power. So if I take the same function of q, but multiplied by this rational power of q and call that a function of q, then I find that if I take the vector, it's now a vector valued modular form, something I haven't mentioned, if I take the vector of g and h at tau plus one, well, that's completely trivial. Because if you change tau to tau plus one, you don't change q, but you change q to the 1 60th by what I called zeta 60 before. So here I'll get zeta 60 to the minus one, and here, for the same reason, I'll get zeta 60 to the 11th. So this is trivial and has no meaning. If I put any other power series at random, this would be true. That alone is a bore. The second formula alone is also, it's already surprising, but it's the combination that makes it a modular form, because I'm going to give you a formula. Now, for g of minus 1 over tau h, sorry, g of minus 1 over tau h of minus 1 over tau, and if you remember, the transformations tau goes to tau plus 1 and tau goes to minus 1 over tau give you the whole modular group. So anything that transforms under those two is actually a modular form on the whole modular group SL2z. But here it's vector valued, and the actual formula I can never remember. So I, it's a matrix, of course, no longer diagonal. It's 2 over the square root of 5. I think I can remember the rest. Sine 2 pi over 5. Sine pi over 5 minus sine pi over 5. No plus sine pi over 5, and here minus sine 2 pi over 5, times g of tau, h of tau. So in other words, this vector value thing, under all transformations of the modular group, uh, transforms into a multiple of itself, but the multiple is now a matrix. So that's to show you a little more, again, of the riches of modular forms, and that there are more kinds than I've been telling you. Here's vector valued, and there are many, many, many other kinds of modular forms. Yes? Uh, sorry, what are you talking? Q equals, one. Q equals 1 is not allowed. I remind you, I, it's not allowed. I remind you that Q is e to the 2 pi i tau, and that imaginary part of tau is positive. Of course, you can take the limiting value, it's true. If you take the limit, yeah. if you take the, that's true, okay, I'll, I'll make the comment. It's a perfectly nice one. You cannot take Q equals in, uh, 1 here, because that means tau is 0. It's not in the upper half plane. So these functions make no sense. In fact, they're both infinite. But they both diverge the same way. So g of q, g of 1, is infinite. And h of 1 is also infinite. And you're not allowed to take q equals 1. It's forbidden. My q is always strictly less than 1, because it's e to the 2 pi i tau, and tau is in the upper half plane. However, it is true that g and h diverge the same way. So if I put back, which I've now erased, what this thing was, it was h of q over g of q. And indeed, that limit does have a limit. And this, of course, you're quite right. If I take q equals 1, this is the well-known continued fraction of 1 plus square root of 5 over 2. And that indeed tells you that there is a 5 floating around somewhere. So it slightly reduces the surprise. Actually, that's why I was not going to mention that. I thought of it. But now you've spoiled it by pointing out that the 5 actually is not quite as mysterious as it looks, because here you see it. But just to say that on the modular level, you cannot take q equals 1, but as a limiting value, you can. OK, now I want to get back to my story. And I've used up almost an hour and haven't come to the thing I meant to talk about in this third hour, because 
well, it was, it's not an accident. I planned, I decided this morning to talk, talk more about partitions first because it's more elementary and the lectures, some of them have been getting you know, a little high flown and also it's a lot of fun and it's very beautiful and if, if you haven't seen it, it's worth having seen. So now I want to come to my other subject. So using A to remember yesterday, I defined if I have a modular form or any function of tau, I defined f prime of tau as the usual derivative, but for convenience, I divide it by 2 pi i. So in other words, prime is usual derivative divided by 2 pi i, or equivalently, it's differentiating q and multiplied by q. That had the advantage that it kept rational coefficients, so q to the n prime is simply n times q to the n. That's very convenient. And then I showed you that if you take eta prime and divide by eta and multiply by 24, then just from the definition as an infinite product, I won't even write it again, what you get is the sum, sum of the device of nq to the n. I'm not going to go through this again. What you get is this function e tau, which is, is an Eisenstein series, and it's very like e4 and e6, but it's not quite modular. And so what I told you yesterday, and I'm not going to go into any detail, so we also have to remember e4 and e6, so in general ek is one plus a certain constant, uh, I don't know, gamma k, let's call it, times the sum n from one to infinity, sum of the device of n to the power k minus one, q to the n, and gamma two is minus 24, as I just wrote, gamma four is 240, gamma six is minus 504, gamma eight is 480, and so on. So it's just some numbers that, whose definition plays no role here, but they're, they're explicit numbers. So then what we showed, that what I discussed the first day, is that if you take m star, which is the ring of all modular forms, then this is simply polynomials in E4 and E6. That's not obvious, but it's not a very deep theorem. It's, it's a one-page proof. It's on you know, the, like the third page on my book of the beginning of the theory, but still you have to prove it. But then this is in a larger ring, which is called quasi modular forms. I'll abbreviate QMF, although I also like to use Q for quantum modular forms. This is quasi. Maybe I'll put small q, mf, for quasi modular forms. And this one, well, E2, I, I'm not going to give you the complete definition because it plays no real role. And in this case, E2 satisfies that definition. It forms a ring, so every polynomial in E2, E4, and E6 is quasi modular if you know the formal definition. And then it's a theorem that they give the ring. And so you can just take this as a definition. So for our purposes, modular, quasi modular just means a polynomial in those. But it's a silly definition. And there's a good one like the definition of a modular form by some kind of transformation property. It would take me five minutes to explain. I don't want to. It's not that enlightening, and I'll skip it. OK, so now we have that. And now I want to tell you a completely different story, and that's my, the story that I meant to tell in this lecture, and I'll tell it now in, in a curtailed form. So in physics and in mathematics, more precisely, physics is very big. And a tiny part of it, in fact, many physicists say a part that's disjoint from it. So it's not quite a part of it because not all physicists even like it. But there's a thing called string theory in physics. And there's a thing called algebraic geometry in mathematics. And whether or not this is physics in the sense of being testable in the lab sort of remains to be seen. But in any case, they're both wonderful theories. And in both of them, you have slightly different versions of so of a thing called mirror symmetry. Mirror symmetry, I'm going to say, I, I won't say really anything about the mirror symmetry part, but it's connected with something else that certainly almost everyone will have seen these words, gromov witten invariance. And so I won't say just a word about uh, what, what they want to do in these things very, very, very briefly. But it's full of modular forms sometimes, and unfortunately, in other cases, one can't make modular forms help, and those are the hard cases. But roughly, this is the situation. X is a very special kind of a variety of some dimension. Well, every variety is undimensional, so I'm just going to call it N. But it's what's called a Calabial variety. The definition is very simple. But again, I'll, I'll skip it because it plays no role. So for string theory, they're interested, especially in the case n equals 3. But I can mention that if n is 2, then these would be, for instance, what are called k3 surfaces. Uh, those are the most interesting. And if n is 1, this exactly elliptic curves, which I already talked about. Again, don't feel you have to understand why it's the same, because I haven't given any definitions. 
But what you do in Gromov Witten theory is you count, that what they say is you count holomorphic curves in, in X. So that means you have a curve C. So C is a holomorphic curve, meaning that it's a one dimensional variety over the complex numbers. So therefore, it's a two dimensional variety over the integer, over R. So it's a surface, but it's got this complex structure. So it's called a Riemann surface. And as I'm sure you all know, such a surface has a genus, like this would be genus two, which is sort of the number of holes. So the genus could be zero, you have a sphere, one, you have a torus, two, you have this, and so on. And then you look at maps from C into X. So C, this is a holomorphic map because we want holomorphic curves. Again, I won't use any of this. So if, if, for, if for some of you, some of these words are completely meaningless, just don't worry about it. Let them wash over your head. And then I'll come to the, to the content, which is you know, beautiful formulas. So if you have such a map, well, then it also induces a map in homology. And the homology in H2 of a curve is there's a thing called the fundamental class, which is unique. So you will get some class in the homology of x. Now, again, even if you don't know every word here, but h2 of xz, whatever it is, it's computable. And so it's some lattice. It might be z plus z. And so you can pick some random vector in it, some vector that you like. And if you know what these words mean, you can ask, how many holomorphic maps do I have from c with this given xi as the image? And so if I fix the genus, I'm being very sloppy, and what I'm saying is definitely not correct as it stands. But roughly, you get a number, which could be even rational for various reasons. But you get a number, quote number, which is the number of curves of a given genus G whose image is a given homology class. And so you get a bunch of numbers. And as you can imagine, what you want to do is to make a generating function. So you have some variable like a capital Q, which generalizes RQ to the power xi in some reasonable sense. And you make a sum over xi, and sometimes even a sum over G with some other variable. So that's what you want to do in of witten theory. By the way, mirror symmetry, there's a word symmetry, says that with one Calabial, actually with one family of Calabials, there's another Calabial, actually another family, and that the of witten calculations on the one side, which are very hard, are the same as the picard fuchs differential equation on the other, and it's periods, and that's just what I was talking about today. And in lucky cases, you're back in multiple forms, and you can compute things. And so multiple forms play a very big role in doing this because of this mirror symmetry. But I won't talk about that. So now the physicist Degraff, actually several others, so Rudd and Douglas were also involved, but the main person was Robert Degraff. And he had the idea, it's completely pointless for physics, and it's kind of silly, but let's embed curves not into something three-dimensional or even two-dimensional, but into something one-dimensional. So let's take the case when n is one and, and ask what happens. Well, if n is 1, you can't really embed a higher genus curve into a lower genus curve. So here's a curve of some genus g bigger than 1, like here 2. And downstairs, you have a Calabi-Yau one-fold. But I already said a Calabi-Yau one-fold is an elliptic curve, which just means a curve of genus. I won't call it g, because that's g, but genus equal to 1. And now we have a map. And to say the fundamental class here is just the whole thing. And here, the fundamental class generates homology. And so the only possibility is that this goes to a multiple of this. So the only possibility for our xi is that xi is some multiple n. So this is a, here's my curve, and here's a torus. That it could be some multiple of the torus. So therefore, in that case, well, if n of gn, it's simply the number of holomorphic maps. Well, I'll just put maps, and not, I'm, I'm being so sloppy anyway that nothing I say will make it right. So it's just a for you know, free, free association, it's the number of maps correctly counted, and there are lots of little provisos, from a surface uh, C, well, I'll call this, maybe I'll call it a surface of genus G to a torus of, de of given degree n. So if I'm fixing G, well, a given, so this is a surface of given genus, so I fix that, and also given degree N, because as I said, this homology class, whether or not you know about homology, but in this case, it's very easy saying where the homology class goes is just saying the degree. And the degree, I remind you, just means that if you take a generic point here, there will be exactly, let's say N is 4, then above this point, there'll be four points. So if I take a little neighborhood, you usually draw it as a sheet. Well, I could take a little two-dimensional neighborhood. Then above that, there will be typically four disjoint sheets. However, they won't always be disjoint. There will always be points where some of the sheets cross. They're called ramification points. 
So if I draw this schematically, because it's too much work to draw this each time like this, then the sheets are just four lines. The simplest kind of ramification would be only two of them to come together, and the others wander off happily. This is called generic ramification. So over a bad point where some sheets meet, only one pair meets in one point. In other words, the pre-image of a point, which here had four, this point down here, had four pre-images, but this point here has only three pre-images, but it's never less than three, so it only goes down by one. That's called generic, and it's important for what I'm doing, so I, I want, but I, it's, since I'm not giving any details, it doesn't matter at all really, but I didn't want to lie too completely. So believe me, there's a way to make this completely rigorous. And actually, there's a slightly easier number, well, no, I'll, I'll say the theorem now. And now Dijkhoff thought of that, and he found a way to compute them, and computed a lot. He gave a closed formula in terms of the group theory of the symmetric group, how to compute them. And he discovered a property which, again, the physicists somehow said they, had a, I mean, they called it a theorem in the sense they just said it's true. And it is true, but nothing that they wrote, as far as any mathematician can see, is even close to, to a proof. It's just true because of some reasons from quantum field theory, various actions and gauges, and so it should be true. But so I'll put theorem, but I, I hesitate to call it, so I'll put Dijkhoff and company, who was Rudd and Douglas, and the other company was uh, Kaneko uh, and myself. We gave, it's very simple. I mean, I'm not saying it was a great breakthrough. The great breakthrough was to discover it, but still we gave an actual down-to-earth proof. And the theorem is very, very nice. I make a function as, you, you, you'll certainly guess by now, a generating function, because we now know that's what you should always do. So this, remember, is the degree. So if you want, you could say this is the sum over all maps from a given surface SG to T, generically ramified. You just take them all, correctly counted, and you take Q to the degree of the map. And so that would be means that if you fix the degree to be N, you're counting how many there are. So this is the generating function counting that. And you think of that, as usual, not as a function of Q, but as a function of tau, though the physicist would just call FG of Q, and then say something false, that that's a multiple form. And the theorem is that this is always not quite a multiple form, but it's a quasi multiple form. In other words, it's a polynomial in E2, E4, and E6. That's really, I think, so that's the topology coming in. Let me give you one example, which is completely misleading. F2 of tau, ah, I may be slightly lying, but let's say I'm not, because I just realized there's a change of notation, but I think it's correct. It should be, and I have no idea why I doubled everything, it's 5 e2 of tau cubed minus 3 e2 of tau. See, sorry, I didn't tell you, it's actually a multiple form of a, of a weight that you know, and it's a famous number in the theory of Riemann surfaces, 6g minus 6, the dimension of the moduli space. So th this fg is a quasi multiple form, and its weight is 6g minus 6. This for g at least 2. So if g is 2, 6g minus 6 is then 6. And in weight 6, well, since the theorem was that quasi multiple forms are polynomials in e2, e4, and e6, there are only three. That's the partitions of three. e2 cubed, e2, e4, and e6. So it has to be a linear combination. And Sorry, let me finish writing the formula before, this, and then otherwise I'll make a mistake, and then I'll listen to the question. Uh, and then the denominator is 5, 1, 8, 4, 0, which looks very rational, but when you multiply this out, it starts with 0, as it has to, because you couldn't have a map of degree 0. And it also has no Q term, because if you had a map of degree 1, they would be isomorphic, but they have different genera. But then the next coefficients are Q squared, so there's one map of degree 2, 8q cubed, 30q to the fourth, 80q to the fifth. And before I answer the question, I just want to say one word. So this expansion looks like it is all integer coefficients, and indeed it does, not just the first six. It is all integer coefficients, even though here there's this big denominator, 51,840, because there are congruences. But that's a fluke. If you take F3 or any Fg beyond genus 2, it will still have a rational denominator here, a denominator, but also here you'll get rational numbers because you, when you count these numbers, there's some technical thing, you get rational numbers. Sorry, now what was the question? Who was it and what? Okay. Okay, so yeah, I was just, I stopped in the middle of, of writing. Okay, so 
Yeah, I didn't see that it was you. Sorry. OK, so that's the, the theorem. And as I say, Kaneko and I proved it by an extremely ugly proof. I mean, it's only two pages. Uh, and it was a nice paper because we introduced the word. The function had been around for many years, but we introduced the word quasi multiform form and a formal definition that included them in their basic properties. And now it's turned out very useful. It's used everywhere. So that paper gets quoted a lot just because of the name and not because of the theorem. But the theorem itself, it's a clever proof, but just a clever proof. It's two pages, very computational, no enlightenment. But then there was a wonderful generalization a few years later by Bloch and Okunkov. And reading the introduction of their paper, I discovered that I suggested that this theorem should be true, and they proved it. I couldn't remember it all and couldn't imagine how they even guessed it. But apparently, I guessed it. I don't remember. I remember the conversation with Bloch, but not guessing the statement. So there's a much bigger class, big class, of combinatorial things, all of which are quasi multiple well, I'm calling them now, quasi multiple forms. So I, have, I do have a few minutes left. I'm going to make an attempt to give you a little bit of the flavor of the bloch okunkov theorem. And uh, I'm doing a big piece of research with somebody, well, he was in Bonn in Frankfurt, Martin Müller, connected with, uh, the, well, it's connected with dynamical systems, but that's his part. Flat surfaces, that's also his part. Ziegel, Veach constants, many things in the theory of moduli. And it requires a huge generalization of this bloch okunkov theorem that we haven't yet got. We know the statement, finally, after two years of work. But it's still conjectural. We've only proved some cases. But as part of that, I studied the bloch okunkov formula. And then I found a very simple proof. And so last year, to inaugurate being at the ICTP, I gave my first course here at CISA, actually jointly with Fernando Villegas. And the theorem was exactly explaining the theorem I now want to tell you. But of course, with all the details and with the proof, now I just want to give it a sketch. So this theorem, to me, is a little bit associated with the ICTP. And actually, the, the first calculations that I did for the project with Muller were also done on an earlier visit with the ICTP and with Fernando's help. So it's got a definite Triestino kind of a flavor in my, uh, for me. Not for you, of course. You just have to take my word for it. OK, so let me give you an idea. And it's really a beautiful idea. And before I come to the actual statement of the theorem, first I'm going to give you the, the framework. This is the idea of Bloch and Kunkov. And all physicists among you will recognize immediately the nature of what I'm doing. So let me, let me take P as the set of all partitions, of all numbers. So a partition is just lambda, which as I told you before is lambda 1, lambda 2, where the lambda i's are decreasing and go to 0, and only finitely many are non-zero. Oh, sorry, lambda 1 greater than or equal to lambda 2, et cetera, down to 0. So every partition is a partition of some number. The number it's a partition of is called uh, you know, size of lambda. So this is simply the sum of the lambdas. It is finite. And then, as I said before, I also write lambdas in Pn, or some people write lambda bar n, but I'll just use pn. So this is just the union of p0, p1, disjoint union of the various pn's. And now let f, ah, but I see f is very poor because I've been consistently using f for uh, multiple forms. I'll use capital F and hope I remember. Let f from p to q be any function, anything that you like. So you just assign, in some way that pleases you, to every partition a rational number. Now, sometimes you may have made a stupid assignment. The theorem will say that for a very large class of such Fs, but by no means all, something nice will happen. For the moment, for what I'm going to do, you can take any function. And now I'm going to define a formal power series. But it will have rational coefficients, but it's only a formal power series. So again, if you, haven't, if you don't know that notion, it means you write down a generating function, some a i q to the i, and you don't worry if there's any q at all for which it converts. It's just a way to write down the coefficients, but you can add and even multiply formal power series. So they form a very convenient ring, and you don't care about convergence. And so this is called the q bracket, or q average. And what you do, and as I say, this the form of this form, then I'll say a few words about that. It's something very uh, familiar to physicists. You take what you would like to do. It's supposed to be the average value. So you want to take an average. 
So if you take an average, you have, uh, if you have six numbers, uh, you know, three, seven, well, let's have two, three numbers, three, seven, two, the average is you add them up and you divide by how many there are. But if there are infinitely many, then if you add them up, you'll get infinity. And if you add one plus one that many times, you also get infinity. So you have to do something. So what I would like to do is take f of lambda for all partitions divided by the number of all partitions, which is the sum of one. But obviously, that's nonsense, because there are infinitely many partitions. And f of lambda will, unless you chose something very funny, will not usually converge. But now, you put in a weighting factor, and it's going to be this variable q, which is just a formal variable for the moment. There's no e to the 2 pi tau here. And here, you put the n where, uh, where that's q to the n. But then, since it should be an average, here you have to do the same thing with q to the lambda. And so this is called the q average of the q bracket. And it's absolutely a familiar construction from statistical physics. Uh, th this would be, you have a statistical system, so you have a large collection of states, here even infinite, the p's would be the states, and then to each state you have a certain quantity that you want to measure, an observable, let's say, in the quantum theoretic language, that would be the f of the state, it's whatever it is, but you want to take all states, so you want to take the sum of all of them, but that won't converge, so you put a formula, and our q is, as usual, going to be e to the 2 pi i tau, but if I think of 2 pi I tau to be the inverse temperature in statistical physics, actually inverse temperature times Boltzmann's constant, then that would be the typical weight that you put, that if you think of lambda as the energy of the state, then typically you would take you know, e to the energy divided by Boltzmann's constant times the temperature, so here that would become q to the lambda. And the point is that because this q is small, it's infinitesimal, or in the cases we care about, this will actually converge. So although I said formal, in all the cases I'll write down, it will actually converge. So q just has to be less than 1 in absolute value. Then this q to the energy is a weighting factor, which tells you what the temperature is. So the, the higher or the lower the temperature is, the nearer q is to 0 or 1. And the more terms you have to take, so in one direction it kind of becomes rigid. In the other, there's a lot of statistical motion. But you always want to divide by the thing you would have if the observable were just one. So you want to normalize. And that denominator, I won't use the word because it's totally confusing, but that, of course, is what physicists would always call the partition function and denote by capital Z. So this is a completely familiar construction. Now you can forget those words because I'm not, of course, doing statistics. And this is the definition. So if you, if you think of it, then if you think of this denominator, well, how's the numerator? The numerator I could also write as the sum. And now I take simply the partitions of a given number n, f of pn, f of lambda, and then q to the n. So that's the same thing. I've just written it in a different, different way. And similarly, downstairs, I would have n from 0 to infinity. Now just the number of partitions, p of n, q to the n. But we already saw that this is a of tau inverse times q to the 124th. So what, it, what the whole thing means is that if I multiply a of tau times this q bracket, then I can also write this as the sum over all partitions, f of lambda, and now it's q to the power of lambda minus a 24th. And the 24th comes from the, so this isn't a theorem, this is just a restatement. So that's the definition, except that I forgot I'm using capital F. Somebody would have told me. OK, so that's the definition of this q bracket. And now, let me give an example. So example. There exists, this is from the, the, the calculation that I told you of uh, Degraff and, and maybe Douglas. There is a specific function. Uh, I could tell anyone who wants to know in, in a question, but for now I just want to skip it. It's a function of partitions. It's actually z-valued. such that if I take the, I'll first lie and then I'll correct it. If I simply take all partitions of a given number n, and I take this function, nu of lambda to the power, some even number. So since it's even, let me call it 2g minus 2, where g could be a genus. Then this will be exactly the number n of gn that I talked about before. Actually, it's not quite. It's a slightly different number, n tilde. If you remember what n of gn was, it was coverings. For instance, if 
you know, it was coverings of this by connected Riemann surface of a given genus, which means that the Euler characteristic here is 2 minus 2g. But you could also have disconnected things where you might have several surfaces above it. So uh, coverings aren't always connected, but you can take the union of this, and if the sum of these Euler characteristics is 2 minus 2g for some g, then you get a new number, and that's n tilde, and there's a very easy passage from one to the other. So the theorem I wrote down before, which has gotten erased, but I want to put it back. No, it's still here. Just the word theorem got erased. The previous theorem was that the sum, the generating function, n of gn, the number of ramified coverings of degree n, q to the n, was a multiple form. It's completely equivalent because of the easy passage from one to the other. Just believe me, you can equally prove it, and it's three minutes to go from one theorem to the other. You can do it with this. So that theorem is this. And so if you think what that means, I can now restate this theorem. This is nothing else than uh, wait, something is slightly wrong. It's not exactly like that, but let me get it right. Let me just say what the correct theorem is. So what I said is slightly wrong because of this denominator, very slight technical thing that I don't want to write down because it's just a distraction. Let me write down what the theorem is. So the theorem above, this theorem, is equivalent to a new, so the theorem of Descraft and company and Kanek and myself, the rigorous theorem, is equivalent to the following theorem. Let g be a, a number bigger than, bigger than or equal to 2. Then I take this function nu that I told you about here, that I haven't given you the definition, to the power 2g minus 2. That's a specific function on partitions, which associates the partition nu, the number nu of lambda to the power 2g minus 2. And then you see this sum here is exactly what was written here. And so this whole generating function is just what I want. And so this final theorem is that the Q bracket of this is a quasi modular form of genus 6g minus 6. So that's completely equivalent to the theorem that we had. But, in a, but stated in a completely different way. And it's not completely equivalent because Descartes first had to do a reduction to prove this statement, that this sum of things, that part's elementary using known things about coverings of surfaces and the connection with group theory, but it takes some work. But we used that. So we actually didn't prove directly the topology thing. We used his formula. So we actually proved the theorem in this form, but we didn't know this beautiful formulation with this Q bracket, with this average value. So now we have that. And so when Bloch and Okunkov, actually Bloch and I had a long conversation about this theorem. And I remember saying that it had to generalize, but I thought we didn't guess the generalization and he found it later. But in their paper, it's written that actually I guessed some, some statement. But the theorem is very explicit, but I can't completely give it to you, I think, because I'm running out of time. So I'll just say a few words about the nature of the proof I was going to. So Bloch and Okunkov. define a series of functions. And I'll give you an idea, if I have time just afterwards, a series of functions, q, well, you could even have q0 of a partition would always be 1, but q1 of lambda, q2 of lambda, q3 of lambda, well, and you can imagine how it goes on, q4 and so on. The reason I picked out these three is that these three I can tell you in closed form what they are. This is exactly the function well, I didn't introduce it yet. It's the function called zero. So Q1 of lambda, it seems rather pointless, but I need it for my statement of the theorem. Q1 of lambda is always zero. Q2 of lambda is n if lambda is a partition of n, but it's not quite. There's a minus 1 over 24th, which we just saw in the theorem that I, in the statement that I stupidly erased, that the Q bracket of any function f times was equal to 1 over eta times the sum over partitions f of lambda, and then we'd hear q to the power lambda minus the 24th. So we already saw that combination, lambda minus the 24th. And finally, q3 of lambda is exactly the function that I just called nu of lambda. So you see that, OK, and now they, do, they introduce a ring, which is simply the ring generated, well, as an abstract ring, it's just generated by infinitely many variables of weight, 1, 2, 3, and so on. But as a f you can think of anything, any element of this ring is a polynomial in the QIs, and so you can evaluate it on lambda by taking the same polynomial in QI of lambda. It becomes a function, so any function here will have a Q bracket. 
And then their big theorem is Loch and Okunkov, of which then I found a very, very simple proof and presented in this course. This thing is always a quasi-modular form. And to be more precise, if F has total weight K, so Q1 is weight 1, Q2 is weight 2, Q3 is weight 3, and so on, if the total weight is F is K, then its Q bracket will have the same weight, will be quasi-modular of that weight. So you see, this theorem is a very special case because nu, as is written here, is Q3. So this is the same as Q3 to the power 2g minus 2. And so its weight is indeed 6g minus 6. So that's the absolutely wonderful generalization. And the only thing that I owe you is to at least tell you what the functions are. I was going to give a mini, mini sketch of the key fact that you use for the, at the end, the, the proof I give is one line, but of course, like all the one-line proofs, there's a lot of preparation for that line. So I can't quite give it to you, either the line or the preparation, but I'll tell you roughly what the QIs are. So the last part of the lecture, it's five more minutes. You can forget modular forms. You can forget everything. Actually, you can stop listening, of course. It's completely independent, but it's kind of cute. It's how you describe a partition. So a partition you can do in, in many different ways. And the one I want to describe, so it's called Frobenius coordinates, but I have a nice numerical example here. So I'll write it, I'll take it so that I have it right. So let's take the example, the partition 50, uh, n is 15, and the partition of lambda, so lambda will be 15, it's the partition 5541. Okay, that's my partition, my example. And just to give you an example of the values, here's of this particular, I told you that we have this qi of lambda, so Q1 is always 0. Q2, I already told you, is the size of it, 15 minus a 24th. So if you're good at mental arithmetic, you'll believe me that that's 359 over 24. The third one is a little simpler. It's 10. The fourth one is way worse. It's 176407 over 5760. But then the next one is rather easy again. Uh, there's a reason, actually, for the madness, but it doesn't matter. Just to say that this is completely explicit. So when you make a partition, what you do often is you represent it by what's called the Young diagram. So the first five, you make a row of five squares. The second five, you make another row of five squares. The next four, you make a row of four squares. The one, you make a row of one square. So you turn it into what's called the Young diagram, which is an array of squares starting in the upper left in English-speaking countries, but in, the, in a different corner in France. So this is the English uh, format. And then... Uh, okay, so that's how, how such a partition would look. And now we're going to introduce what's called Frobenius coordinates. So every such partition, lambda, will correspond to Frobenius coordinates. A wonderful mathematician. If you want to know all about his discoveries, ask Fernando Villegas, because he's a big fan and has read many of his papers. And this will consist of a triple. Well, it's, an inf it's a big triple. There'll be an, an integer r that's at least one. And then there'll be a sequence a strictly decreasing sequence of non-negative integers of length of that length. So I don't really need the R because you can read it off, but it's and then a second strictly decreasing sequence, independent of the first, I mean, they can be the same, of course, if they feel like, uh, of the same length. So and, and conversely, given any R and two decreasing sequence of integers of the same length, you know, it's two sets of positive integers of the same cardinality, you can make a partition. And here I can show you how it goes. Here are in this example, I can't draw a diagonal, but you take the longest diagonal. So this is the, I like to tell this, I told the joke in my course, it's, it's my discovery. This is the H index. I hope some of you are too young to have encountered this monstrosity called the H index. This is the idea that you can judge a scientist, you can translate a scientist into a single number, how good he is, called the H index, like you know, 73, then he's a wonderful scientist. Three, he's a terrible scientist. And so the H index is you count how many, not just how many papers he's written, because he could read a, write a lot and nobody reads them, and not the total number of citations, because he could have written one very popular title, you know, Modular Forms and Sex, and then nobody read his others. So the H index, you list his paper in decreasing order of citations. So his best paper has five citations, the next is five, the next is four, and then you look where the diagonal, how far it goes. So the H index is three. It means I've written at least three papers that at least three people have read. If it's 73, I've written at least 73 papers that at least 73 people have read. It's not completely stupid, but it's pretty stupid. Anyway, this is the H index. It's the length of, if that's the publications, five citations, five, four, and one, then the H index is R. And now, 
if I look at this, then I have these diagonal squares. Well, they're always there. And then I've divided up the rest into 4 and 3 and 1, and here, 3 and 1. So in this case, the, the forbidden coordinates would be 3, and then these are the lengths of the arms, A for arm, uh, so it would be 4 and 3 and 1, which is strictly decreasing and positive, uh, greater than or equal to 0, I said. And the, then there are B, which are the bind of the legs. It would be 3 plus 1 plus 0. So in this case, this would be the Frobenius coordinates. And I can actually now give you the formula for QI will then be the sum I from 1 to, well, it's actually 1 over K minus 1 factorial times the sum I from 1 to R, and then it's AI, but you don't actually want to use AI, you want to use AI plus a half. You want to take those four plus this half. So this is the enhanced Frobenius coordinate. So it should really be four and a half, three and a half, one and a half, and here three and a half, one and a half, and a half. And then you see it just adds up even nicer. So I take A plus a half, and then I take the moment. Except that since the AIs are above the diagonal and the BIs are below, I take the alternating moment like that, and the I should have been K, so I guess this is I minus 1 factorial, and that's not quite right, then you have to add a constant. But the constant is 0 for odd numbers, so B to, zero is, B to 1 is 0, for instance. So let's do it if I is 1. No. This is also I minus 1. Now we can do it. If I is 1, this is 1, and that's also 1. So you have as many 1s here as 1s here, because the, there are as many uh, arms as there are legs, and so you get 0. So that's why Q1 is 0. Now let's do Q2. This is 1 factorial. Here it's the sum of the A plus a half. So that's the sum of these volumes. Minus, ah, I made another mistake. Here you have to take these as negative numbers and nevertheless subtract. So now, depending when, when I was 1, this was 1 minus 1. But if I is 2, this is a plus a half minus, minus b plus a half. So it's the sum of these areas plus the sum of these areas. So that's the total area. So Q2 would be n, which is the size of the partitions, except I have to add this beta 2. And beta 1 is 0, but beta 2 is not 0. The odd ones aren't. They're the coefficients of some easy function. It doesn't matter. And so it's actually 1 minus the 24th. That's the formula that I showed you. But then Q3 again would be, this, would be 1 half times the sum uh, a from 1 to r. And then it would be now ai plus a half squared. So that's a squared plus ai plus a quarter minus bi squared minus bi minus a quarter. So the quarter goes away. And then you see that you're in luck because a squared plus i is even, and so is this, and so this is still an integer. And then it's a theorem, which means nothing to you because I haven't defined new. But the function new, I told, well, that is new, but there's an, an intrinsic definition. That's the formula. So the new function is this. The function lambda minus the 24th is that for i equals 2, and the function 0 is that. So indeed, the three special cases I gave you are special cases of this uniform formula. And now at least I've given you a complete statement of the block Okunkov formula, and the one-line proof is very pretty, but you aren't going to get to see it unless there are questions. So thank you for today. Don't be shy. Well, apparently for the first time I was completely clear. I explained everything. I hope that some students will stay and that they will not be shy and will have questions, even if it's fewer than the other days. The question <laughs> sessions with the students on the first two days were absolutely wonderful, very good questions, and it was really, at least for me, fun, and I, was, uh, I hope that some of them will be coming back today. So, okay, thanks. <laughs>